My name is Gavin Watson, and uh, I'm the director of the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning and the uh, Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning here at Memorial University. My pronouns are he, him, and it's my pleasure to be facilitating this conversation this afternoon with uh, a panel of esteemed guests uh, from across the institution and with different perspectives. So before I um, launch into the um, substance of our, of our time together, I do want to take an opportunity to invite uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And um, I mean, it's really quite uh, simple. Just tell us where you're from uh, and that'll help provide uh, a sense of, of who we've got here at the, uh, at the virtual front of the room, perhaps. So I'm going to go through this like I have it in my um, like I have it in my uh, uh, agenda here, and I'm going to first call on uh, Dr. Mark Berry. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Gavin. Uh, so my name is Mark Berry. I'm the head of the Department of Biochemistry in the Faculty of Science. Uh, so I guess I've kind of seen things over the last two years from. Uh, two perspectives from uh, being front and centre teaching courses, but also from a little bit of the back end administration aspect of, dear God, why did you do that sort of thing? Uh, so, yeah, I kind of have a little bit of a split personality about some things. Perfect, Mark. And hopefully you were directing that, dear God, why did you do that thing directly to me? I'll just that that's perhaps to the to the universe, uh, but I'm glad you're joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, next on my list is Dr. Rebecca Milley. Rebecca, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Dr. Rebecca Milley, and I'm a faculty member at Grenfell Campus. I'm currently the chair of the computational math program here in the School of Science and the Environment. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, and next would be Dr. Echo Pittman. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Echo Pittman. I'm the Associate Registrar uh, at the Academic Advising Center Registrar's Office. Uh, I lead a team of professional advisors to support our exploratory students. Uh, I myself also a uh, course instructor, so my perspective is much more from the administrative side, leading my group for change to uh, support students, as well as my own personal experience in teaching with students. Thanks, Echo. And uh, it's uh, really important that we have student perspective on this panel, and so I'm pleased to introduce our, our student panelists. And the first is uh, Timalayan Oguntuyaki, uh, who is a graduate student. Timalayan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Timalayan Oguntuyaki. I'm a doctoral student in environmental science, and I'm also uh, a learning technology coach at CITL. Thank you. Thank you to Milan. Uh, and then finally, uh, Emily, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name's Emily. I'm uh, going into my fourth year of the Bachelor's of Human Kinetics and Recreation Cooperative degree. Well, thanks to both of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here and uh, to our 88 participants. I guess we're double counting panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, the way that this is going to work is though it's called a panel. Uh, I'm really interested in facilitating a conversation. We've got about uh, five different questions that uh, will be our prompts. And then I'm going to invite one member of the panel to uh, respond to that question, but then quickly in attempt to engage in conversation. This is where the back channel or the text chat comes into play. If you want to add your two cents or agree uh, with something that's being said or ask a prompting question, feel free to add that. And if it's relevant and uh, and we can incorporate it in the conversation, we will. Um, the goal here is to explore uh, the uh, the work that's been undertaken over the last 24 months uh, in response to the pandemic. This is probably the session that uh, everybody might have expected to be the case uh, at a teaching and learning conference. And so I'm, I'm happy that we're all here to explore this. Um, I'm sure all of us have, uh, can, if you think back to March uh, of 20. 20, I can't even remember the year. Uh, we've all have uh, uh, that that moment or that crystal, the, the sort of uh, first moment when you realize that things were changing uh, from uh, the status quo. Uh, and I, speaking for myself, um, there were somewhat naive conversations around the office and frankly around the institution about how long this was going to last. <laughs> Excuse me. 
talking about how you know we might uh, be at home for six weeks and then we'll be able to resume the semester as planned. That did not turn out. Uh, and so uh, it is interesting to reflect back uh, and with the benefit of hindsight, consider um, what was different and what changed. And certainly we've had lots of lived experience of teaching and learning uh, within the institution over these past months. But um, there's a moment here to pause and not that there's ever going to be one moment in time where we stop looking backwards and start looking forwards. But it is this conversation is an opportunity to think about um, what we've had to do over the past 24 months. Uh, consider what worked, what didn't work and what we want to uh, adopt moving forward. So. Um, that kind of uh, reflection, uh, I don't think is ever done and will continue because uh, I think one of my uh, key and core beliefs is that we're not returning back to the way things were in 2018. Uh, fall 2018, I know that's a number of years before the pandemic, will not exist in the same way as, as uh, fall 2023 will exist. And so given all those things, we have an opportunity here to consider um, what we want to do as far as our teaching and learning environment is concerned, noting that many of the decisions that we made were not, uh, we were forced to make those choices. And now that we have the opportunity to reflect and think differently, um, uh, my hope is that they, as we as educators, we as students, uh, and we as members of the university community can consider what it is that's important to hold on to and what we want to leave behind. And so that's really the, the nature of our conversation today. So I'm going to dive right into the, the questions here, and I'm going to um, first start by uh, asking Rebecca to reflect a little bit about um, about the past 24 months. And I would say, I, like I've alluded, uh, while there certainly were challenges, uh, I also know that um, from uh, your perspective in the classroom that there might have been some good aspects of what happened in the last two years. So I'm just wondering if you can um, share with us what you uh, thought some of the best parts of the past two years were? Yeah, sure. And I'll just start by giving a little bit of context from my experience, because I have a slightly unique experience uh, in that I was on sabbatical for a large part of this, fortunately. for um, So I taught remote at the end of uh, the winter 2020 semester. Then I was on sabbatical for a year. And then I taught again this year. But my classes, for the most part, were in person this year. Although this semester, of course, we had everything. We had in-person, sorry, we had um, remote and then in-person. Then my family had COVID, so I was back remote for a couple of weeks. Then we're back in person. So I, I got to experience it all sort of just this winter alone. Um, so the best parts to me, I mean, starting this winter term, for example, when we found out we had to be remote, I think it felt sort of like a bonding experience to me. It was a small class that I had there's sort of a camaraderie, a connection that you get, like, I mean, you know, I felt like I was steering a ship at sea, you know, and trying to keep everybody together. So, I mean, I felt that that was a nice experience. Even I hadn't met some of those students yet. It was a new class. So it, it was an interesting thing. I think, I think there was a bit of that going on, at least in the smaller classes throughout the last two years. I think another positive is anytime we're taken out of our comfort zone, for me, you know, standing at a chalkboard in a classroom, we're forced to really reflect on what do we normally do and what what about that was good even before the pandemic and what about it was bad. So um, in my case, I, I always felt that part of my teaching philosophy was to focus on how it was feeling from the student's perspective. But I think when, when, when you're staring at a screen of blank rectangles, that really makes you do that even more, right? So I was really focusing on organizing the course and making sure the learning objectives were explicit and giving more practice and more this and more that. Again, everyone's at sea, how do I keep them afloat? That kind of feeling. So I think those were some positives to take away from these years. Thanks, Rebecca. Does anybody else wanna share their uh, positives? Go ahead, Echo. Uh, I think for me, I'm a course instructor. I think that for the past two years, it's really given myself time to reflect on my teaching practice because prior to pandemic, all my classes are in person. And I thought that I have developed a very good uh, teaching practice that fit that in-person uh, class. Uh, didn't really see the value of using the learning um, management system. Use it as a very superficial way. Whereas for the past two years, boy, I've learned a lot. Uh, 
uh, when I had in the, I think in the fall 2020, that we have to put everything online to engage students. And just like Rebecca said, it's really hard to teach when you only see circles in the screen and there's no facial expression didn't really know how to engage students. And through the process, I start to learn how to be better to engage students. So I think uh, for those lessons are very valuable. Now, Echo, I, an interesting question. We did hear a lot about the idea that you were seeing empty rectangles. Did, did that continue? Was that an experience that you had throughout the, the pandemic while you were teaching? Yes, yeah. um, most of my students are international students. Some of the respondents, they didn't have the camera. Yeah. And some just prefer not to turn it on. So that's yes. right. Uh, there's interesting work that was. I, um, we're used to being able to see our students, especially when we're teaching in person and we're used to be able to engage and, you know, um, uh, we take, you know, nonverbal cues from from what our students are doing in the class. There's interesting work that's been done over the past 24 months about why students don't turn on um, cameras and, and many of the initial assumptions may uh, don't necessarily bear out. They, it has to do with, um, as you suggested, students don't have the technology or the bandwidth. Um, and so um, I will list the reasons, but it is really important then to understand the context of our learners and understand the reason and rationale. All I'll simply say is that the first thing that we think of when um, or why students may not turn on their cameras don't necessarily pan out. There are, there are lots of and, and multi, uh, multifaceted reasons why that takes place. As frustrating, quite frankly, as it is. Um, anybody else want to respond to this question? I'm going to pop it into the chat in case uh, anybody in the uh, of our in our yeah. Timolaine, go ahead, please. Thank you. I really like the point that um, the first two speakers made. Um, one thing that stood out for me, especially talking from the technological perspective, is that I've seen instructors come in with a passion to, you know, improve student engagement and say, what can I do in terms of technology, you know, to make my students more engaged? And then most of the times, these instructors do not really have much technological, you know, experience or skills. And, you know, just by working with learning technology coaches in the CITL or with other uh, CITL staff, you know, within a space of three weeks, one month, two months, you know, they are really good at doing new stuff with, with technology. And, you know, at the end of the day, I realized that, yeah, this is in fact one uh, professional development thing that we can hold on to as a result of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Mark, do you want to respond to that question? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd just say that I didn't find it was just restricted to use of video. I found an awful lot of students were very reluctant just to use a microphone as well. And so most of the interaction was through a typed chat box. And that that made it very difficult uh so there were you know at the start there were lots of really good ideas about how to engage students and have different you know ways of delivering material and interacting with students but that tended to fall apart as soon as you got in there because a lot of them were kind of assuming that people would be willing to turn on their microphone or they would be willing to you know have the video on and when you were just it was almost like uh, teaching through text messaging, which was uh, very dissatisfying in all honesty. Uh, and so, you know, me personally, I very quickly moved away from trying to do the live sessions and focused a lot more on trying to put engagement in, in an asynchronous manner, uh, which you know, resulted in, uh, and one of the things I found is when you were recording material to give to students, it actually took a far less time than classroom delivery. Uh, I went back and totaled up for my courses and the recordings were about 60% of total classroom time. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I never finished classes 60% early right. uh, so what i focused on was you know what were those asides that i would do it that i was doing in class right. 
what were those you know strange tangents that you were going on and actually trying to put those into Brightspace and type those into Brightspace and provide links so that students still had that you know downtime if you like but still content somewhat content related yeah uh, I appreciate the observation that maybe synchronous in-person classes didn't work in the same way that they did before um, and that you needed to translate a little bit of your practice into into another into another domain um, we've got some comments in the chat here talking about approaches that folks made and um, Edward's asking about research around the camera thing. I will attempt to look for it and uh, post it in the chat, but if we can't get to it, um, I'll be able to share. Uh, Emily, were you gonna say something? Um, yeah, so um, I guess I'm part of that younger generation that wasn't exactly 100% comfortable with, you know, turning on your mic and stuff like that. Um, a lot of us, um, we were well personally i was taken out of university kind of and switched into this online world my first year was cut short so it was a big change and i guess it was a lot of two people weren't exactly comfortable um i read dr burns comment there um in the chat and i was lucky enough to take anatomy with dr burn and she mentioned the small group work um a lot of our labs were synchronous um, and the small group work, I noticed that, especially in the groups that we were in, a lot of people, people were a lot more comfortable with keeping their mics and cam like engaging more that way um, in that. I guess it was just, I guess it's a familiarity thing too. A lot of people didn't know who was in their classes and stuff like that a lot of, so that's just something to kind of bring forward and keep in mind as well. Thanks, Emily. Well, I'm going to move on to our next question then. I don't think we've finished exploring that, uh, but there's some interesting observations that people had to share. The next question is actually for you, Emily. I'm wondering, um, uh, uh, folks, when they came and talked to uh, staff at CITL about perhaps what they needed to do in order to um, adapt teaching and learning to um, to the context of the pandemic, uh, we we would talk about things like flexibility, so providing um, students flexibility around deadlines or um, uh, emphasizing kindness um, as two approaches that instructors um, were uh, should and, and could take to ensure the success of students. Uh, I'm wondering what you saw or experienced um, in your courses uh, over the past two years that that helped you in your own success. For sure, I think, um, I mean, it's no secret that this was a difficult time for everyone, for students, for uh, teaching staff, for everyone to just kind of adapt and learn. I mean, we were all kind of going through this really hard time together. Um, for me, it was a big, big change being at home and you have all these distractions. And, and I mean, it is hard, you watch the news and it's it brings your mood down. So. I had a lot of positive experiences personally with my profs. You, I found that a lot of them were open and receptive to, hey, I'm not doing that well. I'm not in a good mental headspace right now. Is it possible that I could get a slight extension? And I would confidently say 80% of the time, most profs were very, very um, accommodating and kind. Um, a friend of mine was going through a really tough time. One of her parents had fell ill and she had a meeting with a prof to discuss um, just getting some extensions, maybe if she could get her work before. And uh, this has always kind of stuck with me. Um, our prof asked how she was doing and she said, oh, like I'm trying to keep up on schoolwork. Well, but she said, no, I asked how you were doing, which was like a nice, almost it made it feel like, okay, there's more than just like a student teacher bond here like these people are caring about how i'm feeling which honestly when you get re um, reactions and that kind of reception from people it makes you more willing to do well in their class and you know what i mean it's just kind of like that positive experience is creating a positive experience there were some times where you know you wouldn't get the accommodation that you need and that's fine because obviously a course needs to go on as planned and that kind of thing. But um, as as a student and just kind of learning to navigate my way through university, also through a pandemic, um, 
I have to say that a lot of the profs that I had were very accommodating and really um, were leaders and helped guide us and help us navigate our way through university and, and learning everything. And yeah, it was a positive experience amidst a bunch of chaos. Thanks, Emily. The one thing that I heard you say, at least with the story of your friend that went and spoke to a, a um, instructor, was that um, not only did they uh, that instructor see that um, that person as a student, but they also saw them as a human. And it is a bit. I don't want to sound trite here, or too uh, too Pollyanna-ish, but uh, I kept hearing again and again the importance of recognizing everybody's shared humanity in all of this, given the struggle that we're going, went through and continue to go through. So interesting to hear that from you. Anybody else want to respond to that question? I think, um, I think one of the nice things about uh, the last two years is now we have a lot of this infrastructure in place to keep that kind of flexibility where appropriate in the future. So possibly students taking courses remotely from one campus to another or something like that. So I think that's a, a big positive. I also though, on the other, on the flip side of it, I think we have to be a little careful. I felt at times during the last two years that kindness and and flexibility or you know they're not always the same thing the kind option is not always to be as flexible i, I felt pressure from admin uh in winter 2020 to to pass students that shouldn't have passed the course it, it would have been a disservice to them because it was a critical second year course they would have needed it for future courses which they would not have been able to do without redoing the course so i think we do have to be careful that uh that we don't just say flexible 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 you know indiscriminately I think that's an excellent point, Rebecca. Um, and the other thing that I heard about flexibility was uh, it changes the nature of the workload for uh, instructors. And maybe, Mark, you've got your hand up. I'll let you respond to that or say what you wanted to say. Yeah, you've you've obviously been following my Twitter feed far too much, Gavin. Uh, I very much echo what uh, Rebecca was saying. The flexibility was great, but finding that balance between appropriate levels of flexibility and not uh, either disadvantaging, disadvantaging some students over others or not putting an excessive burden on the instructors. I think that was a and continues to be a very difficult uh, process. Uh, it's uh, I one of the things I think that did come out in the last two years was how much time it takes to adequately prepare a class, just a single class, and how that is not has never really been considered in assigning workloads and in standard workloads. Uh, you know, it's, I, mean, I was certainly finding from personal experience, you know, you were looking at for every one hour of class, you were probably looking at anywhere six, maybe eight, up to eight hours of work for that one hour of class. Now that includes that one hour of class. Uh, but when you, you know, when you start to add that up over uh, four classes uh, over the, an academic year, and that is meant to be 40% of your job, uh, and do, do the math on that, you come out with some really horrendous numbers. Uh, and I think it's one of the big things that the last two years has done is some of those issues in higher education that you know we've spent the last 20 years kind of sweeping under the carpet the last two years i mean they took that carpet out and nuked the living daylights out of it there was no hiding what some of those issues were now uh and i think it's going to be interesting to see how we move forward now you know, we keep hearing about back to normal, back to normal, back to normal. 
And I think probably the biggest lesson from the last two years is that normal really wasn't very good and isn't very good, either right. from an instructor or a student perspective. Yeah. Uh, which, Echo, you have your hand up. I'll, I'll let you go next and, and perhaps you want to respond to Mark's um, uh, statements or you've got your own perspective that you want to share. Oh, you're muted, Echo. It happened a lot in my class too, <laughs> for students who remind me that. Uh, I just want to respond to uh, uh, Mark's comment regarding the workload, I think for the past two years, uh, we were, we want to be flexible. We want to be kind and we want to be support students. So we, there's a lot of additional work. It's not being considered, for example, recording the lecture and making it into chunk size for student can di digest as well as uh, follow up. Uh, with the students to see how they are doing. Uh, normally, we probably wouldn't have done that much uh, in the traditional in class uh, sessions. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Echo. Uh, Timalayan, do you want to? Uh, is there anything you want to add to this question or or the conversation? For sure. Yeah. In in my own case, I think it is not. It wasn't only about um, teaching. It is also about the supervisory job of professors. You know, personally, I've actually experienced kindness from my own uh, sp research supervisor, and that has actually been a, a, a key factor in my success so far. Because in the past um, couple of uh, years, I was supposed to have been into the field to do field work, maybe one or two times, but because of COVID, I couldn't. But my research kept going, and I got, uh, you know this positive vibe from my supervisor that yeah i could still get some things going and in fact be producing a paper out of you know the darkness <laughs> right thank you so your supervisor was able to continue to support you despite the 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 challenges that we were facing elsewhere absolutely yeah, yeah um as we've articulated here, um, flexibility emerged as a double-edged sword. And to Mark's point, I don't think we've necessarily considered um, what the right balance is. Rebecca, I agree with you. Um, all the flexibility in the world isn't necessarily um, the best for students and, and building their success. It may be what they're asking for. And so that's back to that Age, quite frankly, age old question around student preference, what students prefer versus what's best for their learning. And so I think we'll continue to have this conversation um, uh, it, within the scope of, uh, of flexibility, because uh, there's no question that we uh, identified the fact that flexibility um, specifically within even just the context of mental wellness and mental well being, being able to quickly say, you know, uh, I need a little bit more time with this, and and if that's a possible conversation that can take place, then 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 we are able to reduce um, anxiety perhaps in a, in a class. Um, but that comes with its own costs, uh, and returning to normal doesn't really make sense when normal was uh, perhaps a a myth, as Anne mentions in the chat to begin with. Um, I'd like to turn perhaps then we're talking about giving extensions to assessments and, and actually turn to assessments. Now, this is another place where we um, where where flexibility played itself out, but I, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about your experiences. Um, with uh, assessments, um, how did your approach? This is a, an, a naive question because I know it changed a lot. How did your approach um, to assessment change? Mark, you teach a. Um, uh, a uh, discipline that I imagine pre-pandemic was very um, focused on summative assessments, final exams, lab reports um, that were more difficult to facilitate um, while we were remote. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's uh, to some extent it very much depends on, or it depended on what level the course was whether it, you know it was first year second year third year fourth year level uh you know with the fourth year levels they tended to be more discussion based courses anyway and looking at primary literature and discussions about that so those didn't change as much it was difficult to you know as we've talked about it was difficult to have those discussions 
in a remote environment sometimes. Uh, we certainly, uh, in the first year course, I included things that I probably wouldn't have done before that we're probably now going to continue. So, uh, for example, I uh, included documentary assignments uh, where links to a documentary were provided and then there'd be uh, what I did was there was individual questions to answer based on the documentary, but then there was a group more philosophical discussion uh, related to the documentary aspect. Uh, the students seemed to enjoy that. Uh, one of the things we did find in some in a lot of our courses was we switched because everything was online. We weren't doing things synchronously. So a lot of our courses switched to the exams, quizzes being available for anything up to a 24 hour time window. Yeah. And one of the things we found was, at least in our courses, the number of requests for deferred exams absolutely plummeted. Uh, when there was a longer time window, where students could write the exam in. Yeah. The request for deferrals almost completely disappeared. And yet with some of the other courses in the department where a synchronous, you know, strictly timed time of day exam yes. or even in person when we were allowed those exam, the uh, requests for deferreds were back up to where they normally were. Right. Uh, so yeah, it, it allowed us to experiment with different types of things. Uh, and really, as someone mentioned earlier, really look at and ask the question, why are we doing this? You know, other than, well, this is what I had to do however many years ago. So therefore, that's what I'm going to have my students do. And yeah, I think a lot of people kind of moved on from that a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um... Does anybody else want to share uh, what they experienced as far as uh, completing assessments or how they designed assessments uh, in response to the pandemic? Echo, you've you've unmuted your mic. I can call on you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, uh, for our writing class, no uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, final exam is required. Uh, even across the board, but with the pandemic, uh, instructors have freedom to decide uh, no final exam. So I have found that really useful to remove that high state exam and making students uh, more stressed and expecting them to demonstrate all the concepts or skills we want them to learn. Uh, I have uh, that. Uh, assess their group work and for them to demonstrate their understanding, their skills and st structures, more activities for them to utilize the knowledge to learn and apply and show me the results. I have found that much more useful and for students as well as for me to really assess where my students are. Right. And so is that something that you'll continue doing? Absolutely. Echo? And yeah. I do hope that that uh, final exam across the board, you have first year writing course should have it, should be uh, could be considered to be removed. So giving instructor more freedom uh, to show evidence that students can still demonstrate the expected uh, learning skills uh, yeah. in different ways. Yeah, Emily, you added a, a comment. Do you want to respond? Um, I guess. It goes back, uh, I think someone mentioned, you know, checking in with students. Um, we had a lot of, I mean, my entire second year was online. So that's kind of where you switch from your prerequisite courses to more like interior degree. Um, so it was a big, it was big kind of hit of, okay, what's going on here? We used to do weekly check-ins, whether it'd be a small quiz at the end of the week, a discussion post, that kind of thing. Um, and I found that really beneficial because you had no other choice but to review the material that you had gone over that week again. And uh, it was, I found that again, helped me better grasp the material. But also when we switched back to 
uh, I guess, a sort of in-person learning in uh, in the fall, um, a majority of my uh, profs continued to incorporate that. We had um, end of section quizzes and stuff like that, and it was a great review um, a review tool. Um, so I guess the fact that there's um, remote learning techniques that are still being incorporated into the, you know, back in class learning. It's really, really beneficial. Thanks, Emily. Anybody else want to respond to that question or anything that the panel said? Rebecca, you teach a very quantitative, uh, if I may <laughs> make that uh, assumption, uh, subject. And I uh, just tell me a little bit about if at all, how your assessments changed? Well, not just from my own experience, but uh, I think from mathematics across the country, like colleagues across the country in the States, I know it's been very difficult um, throughout the pandemic. There's been a surge in homework sites like Chegg, yeah. where students can find their, their assignments online. So, and that's not going to go away, right? That's going to stay yeah. in the future. And we still are going to have take home assignments. It's very hard for us because even though those, those are assessments, they're, all, they're really learning. Like that's where the students learn the course is through weekly take home assignments. But if you don't make them worth anything, they don't do them. If you make them worth something, then they're going to cheat. This is the sort of the balance. So that's hard. Um, I, I don't know what a good solution is. Uh, I've, I've tended to um, make rules like you have to pass the final to pass the course. That's not a great rule for like a lot of students don't like that rule. That's a one time. I mean, it's better in math than other disciplines, I think, because really, if you know it at the end of the semester, you know it uh, compared to just having, you know, you had a bad day and you didn't write well. So I'm not sure I'm still working on the best way to to keep students practicing, but also fairly assess and keep integrity in our program and make sure that we have a standard that they're that they're meeting. Yeah, uh, I heard how uh, academic integrity, uh, a different kind of concern around academic integrity emerged, um, largely due to the sites that you articulated, these academic file sharing sites like Chegg or Course Hero. Uh, and um, uh, that is still um, a, 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 a problem, a, a challenge. Uh, an opportunity that we don't have a solution to yet. It's a bit like whack-a-mole uh, in that my sense is that if you, um, that you need a, a different type of solution to solve that problem because simply going after the academic file sharing sites or the students asking them not to share them won't be enough. We almost have to engage in a really critical rethink about how we ask students to demonstrate their knowledge. Um, and that um, I just wanna highlight is a lot of work um, and takes a lot of time and um, reminds me of our conversations um, earlier today during our, our keynote where our introductory comments to keynotes where sometimes we don't have the opportunity to take the thinking time that we need to, to necessarily really revise that. Mark, you were going to say something? Oh, you're, you're muted, Mark. After two years, still can't work this out. Uh, just picking up from what Rebecca said, one of the things that we, I think a lot of us really started looking at was what our definition of academic integrity was and what our definition of cheating was. Uh, yeah, and I know a lot of people have embraced more use of open book exams. Yeah. And you know, have come around to the thinking that you know do they do students just need to memorize everything or is it just as important that they know where to go to get the information and uh you know but then that gets into the you know the question of it, it makes it difficult to time an exam you know if if you make and you know this is where universal design can fall apart a little bit is if you make the exam long enough, everyone can look up every answer. Uh, you know, if they can use the textbook and it's finding that balance then. Uh, one of the things we found students were really, found really stressful was with multiple choices, uh, having a, basically a one minute per question 
which is fairly pretty bog standard, but yeah. students found that incredibly stressful. Uh, yeah. They felt that that wasn't nearly enough time. Uh, and yet that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 30 years in in-person midterm exams. Yeah. Uh, but suddenly when it was presented this way, the stress levels really flew through the roof. Uh, so it, you're striking that balance was very difficult. And I'll just note that, Mark, there's a there's a qualitative difference to writing an in-person exam where, in fact, if you did the math, you have about one minute per question. Then it is writing an exam through a computer where there's a timer counting you down. Uh, and as soon as you press next, in some cases, you can't go back, right? Be, uh, because these are the kinds of um, uh, design decisions that were made to, in to ensure the integrity of the assessment, but that comes with its own impacts. I, I like that you mentioned open uh, open book assessments. I'm going to post a, a link in um, the chat just to some CITL related resources around that because it is it, it is just one of the things that I'm hearing is that there there are new skills that we're learning as educators as students to be able to um, facilitate learning in these different modalities and in these different ways. Open book and, and writing and, and creating good open book assessments um, is not just as simply as saying here's 24 hours, here's your text, here's your question, and I'll and you just need to submit it on the LMS. There's there's it, 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 as you'd imagine, as you'd likely expect, there's a little bit more to that. So. Um, just looking at the time, I'm going to move on to our next question. And in fact, it's for you, uh, Timelin. Um, I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts on something that we saw, I think we saw at the end of this semester, but we're, we were seeing it with students earlier. And that is a trend where um, students disengage. Uh, and uh, I think this perhaps predated the pandemic, but it was really quite visible um, recently. Um, that that disengagement that could probably range from a student simply deciding not to hand in assignments. And there's lots of reasons for that, all the way through to students disappearing but not dropping courses. So, um, but they just disappear. Um, and either you're, I think this semester uh, you could be teaching in person and have nobody in your class. Some people online because I know lots of faculty members and instructors decided to take a, a flexible approach. Uh, but um, what uh, have you experienced that um, in your own classes or with um, in conversations with other graduate students who are uh, you know being who are acting as TAs or who are learning themselves? Thank you for this um, interesting question. Um, you know, you would one would normally think that engagement is going to be like a dependent on how large or few a class is. But in the last two years, I think I have an opportunity to assist in teaching two different classes. One was a first year class that I had many students, like 70, 80, 100. And another was just uh, like a third year class that we had just less than 10 students. But this trend was playing out very clearly in the two classes, despite the difference in the um, number of students, really ridiculous. But students really, you know, sometimes just decide not to show up, you know, just decide not to uh, submit assignments. But I think in my own perspective, I think it is as a result of uh, transitioning from, you know, in-person and during the pandemic going into um, remote or online, and then again, moving out of remote and online, going to hybrid, or in fact, having full in-person um, classes, because people really get adapted to what they are used to, you know, students are really, you know, cool with being in the comfort of their home, you know, they, sometimes they could be in bed and still be in class, but, you know, you're asking them to come to class, you know, to go through the rigor of, you know, jumping from buses, you know, to and trekking on campus and then entering classes. So I feel like it might just be like, um, it might be the transition process 
because we really would not want, we really would not envisage like students, we just, you just call them up from remote and then want them to be in class and participate fully. So yeah, the, the trend was really obvious. And then I experienced it in my classes that I taught. And I think it could just be as a process of transition. Thanks for that observation. I hadn't thought of that notion of transition between modes, but uh, it does have some resonance. Uh, Emily, I'm going to call on you. I, I just wonder if you want to share your perspectives with this. Did you did you see something similar to this? Is there any insight that you can provide us? I very much agree that you know the transition and stuff. It made it hard to engage, but. Um... Again, I feel like I'm a broken record and I keep saying, you know, it was a really, really challenging time for students. Um, me, I had to learn to be very self-disciplined because work was not going to get done unless I did it. Like we weren't in class and you didn't have someone looking at you being like, okay, you need to do this. You need to take these notes. Most times we were home in our rooms with our laptop and you could sit there and then you'd be on your phone and you wouldn't have someone to tell you, no, don't be on your phone. You know what I mean? It, I think that that definitely contributed to the disengagement that, you know, was reported because a lot of students perhaps weren't motivated to develop that self-discipline, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's uh, incredibly insightful, Emily. And um, one of the things that I tend to say again and again is that uh, we not only need to be uh, teaching students subject matter knowledge, so you know uh, that that changes depending obviously on the discipline, but we also need to be teaching them skills that allow them to be successful. Um, and those academic skills, like um, how to take notes, how to stay motivated, how to focus when you're not in class. I often uh, would have said that um, attending face-to-face -face class, the benefit of it is that it it simply provides a really uh, a, you know obvious structure around how a student can, uh, spend, especially an undergraduate student, will spend their time and their week. They know that if, if today is Tuesday, they're going to need to be on campus and they're going to be in class for a certain period of time. When that kind of structure disappears, then perhaps it's easier to disengage. Um, others around the table, do you have any thoughts or observations to share on this? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, th I think that was one of the other things that it was one of the take home messages for me from the last two years was no matter what you do, if 50% of your class liked it, you're well above average. Uh, you know, take that as a win because it it was, I mean, we got comments back in every single class. Some students loved having things asynchronous. Other students absolutely hated having things asynchronous. Some students loved the fact that things were online. Others, no matter what it was online, they without that structure of being in person, in class, and that face-to-face, -face, no matter what it was that the instructor did, how engaging they may or may not be, they just could not connect with the material. And I mean, to add a third personality onto myself, my daughter's in university, and she was one of those latter ones. She absolutely detests the online environment. She's just the way her brain is wired, she wants to be in class, physically taking notes, listening to someone talking to them. Uh, and no matter what the instructors were doing with the remote delivery, it she found it very, very difficult for it to resonate with her. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, and I think that's one of the big things is that flexibility of, and yet to be flexible enough that you know, you can get it up from 40% of the class are engaged to 75, 80% requires a massive investment in infrastructure, which we just don't have at this university or indeed any university. I and mean, we have what, 12 classrooms with lecture capture? It's, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm gonna go to Rebecca and then to Emily. Um, Rebecca, uh, you have something to add? Yeah, I'm just, I think engaging students 
to me, it's been the same as before pandemic of, you know, how do I engage the students? How do I make it worth their time? Like, I don't like to do things that aren't worth my time. So the students really, you need to sell it to them that this is worth your time. Um, are they not coming because they don't think they need to come in order to still pass the course? You know, you have to sell them that, no, you do. You know, you have to kind of do that right from the beginning. But sometimes they don't come um, because they don't, they don't think it's, you know, I'm not going to understand it anyway or whatever. So I'm really trying to focus on making sure that I'm giving them something they can't get elsewhere. They can't get from a video on YouTube. They can't get from reading the book. They can't get just by looking at my notes or looking at a classmate's notes. So how do I give, take advantage of the fact that they've got an expert in front of them, even, even if it's remote, but especially in person is better. But, and, and to me, that's feedback. That's um, responding to them whether it's getting them to type in the chat, like, okay, was that example good, bad, or okay? So everybody just type in right now. Okay, it was, everyone said, okay, well, that means I'm gonna explain it a little bit more. If it's in person, then I'm looking at their faces and, and you know, especially with math where it's abstract, I just, I think, yeah, just being able to, to communicate with them with whatever way that communication goes, that's what we can do that they can't get elsewhere. And that's what's going to engage them. Yeah, uh, there's this narrative of something called personalized learning that gets that gets discussed in K to 12 schools. I'm not suggesting this at all here, but um, what we have is the opportunity to fine tune our instruction based on feedback from students, what what we understand they know and what they don't know. And, and that absolutely is something that they can't get watching a YouTube video um, to the same degree. Uh, Emily, do you wanna um, uh, have the last word here? Sure. I seen uh, in the chat that I guess um, the students will feel more motivated among peers. Personally, I find it easier to establish relationships with not only people in my class, um, but also my professors in person compared to online. And I find that establishing that those establishing those relationships um, that also helps with engagement. So I guess that was probably the difficulty in, you know, establishing relationships with your profs, establishing friendships with your classmates. Um, it was a little more difficult during the um, remote learning period, um, which I think may have contributed to the disengagement. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I'm cognizant of time. We have about five minutes left. Um, and so um, I I'm going to go to the last question, but it's going to be <laughs> really rapid fire. Uh, maybe it's saying one or two things. We'll go to each person and you have the opportunity of saying one or two things. The, the, the last question, but before I dive in there, I just want to let um, folks around uh, who are joining us know that um, in the fall, uh, I'm planning on pulling together a, a working group across the institutions. So that's all of our campuses to have a look at this larger question around what it is that we can learn from our teaching and learning experiences and what it is that we want to do going forward. Um, I'm posting a link to a really just a, if you're interested in being a part of that working group, it would be uh, in the fall, relatively short term, a semester long, small group. Um, you can click on that link and just fill out your information and I'll follow up with you uh, towards the start of the semester um, to involve you in that in that project. Um, and I'm happy to answer further questions after the this is done, but I just wanted to take the opportunity here. There may be those who are um, ready to um, and, and have lots to add around this and, and want to participate in that way. And so I'd appreciate it if you do express your interest. All right. Um, in our closing five minutes, um, uh, and again, I'll just go individual to individual, perhaps one or two ideas. Um, what changes uh, have we made to our teaching and learning practices that we should work hard to keep? And I'll note that we've kind of said some things that I think we are keeping, but it, perhaps we can make them concrete here. Uh, and Echo, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that you didn't get a chance to answer that last question. So do you want to go first? I think two two points, uh, professional development. Uh, I think over the past two years, I've noticed um, more resources created to support teachers and more resources to support students. And I think uh, professional development helps. And I think we should continue and commit it to uh, create those resources that support teacher and as well as support students. Not only in teaching and learning, I think the uh, self-care 
how we can uh, maintain well-being. That's very important. And my second point will be the use of technology. We have learned a lot through the past two years. I hope that we eventually go back to the normal. I don't really know what normal is. That we will remember those lessons we learned, the skills we gained, and we can incorporate them into our future teaching and practice. Thanks, Echo. Uh, technology and professional development is what I heard. Uh, anybody else like to go next? Thoughts on what we want to keep? Uh, Rebecca. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think uh, setting up remote, either synchronous or asynchronous, I think we've had to focus more on organization of our course, on explicit learning objectives and what's going weird. So I think that's always good to keep. I mean, I have been doing that in some of my first year courses. I wasn't necessarily doing it in my upper year courses, but I, I'd like to, to focus on that. I, I'm just making sure the signposting throughout the, the course is, is really strong. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I think for me, it would be uh the flexibility uh with respect to uh, delivery modes to students uh you know recognizing that uh not you know in person 50 minutes on monday 50 minutes on wednesday 50 minutes on friday at a defined time may not be the best for all students and find i guess Increased accessibility would be the best way of looking at it, you know, and it that taps into EDI and all sorts of other things that we need to be aware of. And we've never really introduced properly into our teaching, yeah. uh, but it's going to be costly. Oh, well, I, I have a couch somewhere over here. I'm sure we can find a loony or a toony. Uh, Tim Elaine, go ahead, please. Thank you. I would like to second the idea of technology <laughs> and especially the program learning technology coach program, because I'm not saying this because I'm actually a learning technology coach at CITL, but because I have had the privilege of um, getting feedbacks from instructors and students alike talking about the impact of learning technology coaches in their classes and in their programs. So I would uh, I would largely say that the learning technology program has really, really, really been impactful. Thanks. Thank you. And Emily, you've got the last word and maybe 30 seconds or so. No rush. <laughs> no, I, I agree with the technology. I think it's a really vital aspect for students and it's only beneficial to us. I get it can be a pain in the butt for some profs, but it does really work for us. Thanks, Emily. Uh, thank you, panelists, for joining us. Uh, folks that were joining us around the virtual table, thank you. Um, I really appreciated the insights that you shared and uh, look forward to having future conversations uh, with folks across the institution in the fall to help consider what it is that we're going to prioritize. Because uh, I don't think the discussion's done. This is just the start. Thanks, everybody.